Uh, a quick advertisement, the McCain Institute was founded to promote character-driven leadership in the United States and around the world. It's named to honor the legacy of service to the United States of Senator and Mrs. McCain and the McCain family going back generations. One of the characteristics of the McCain Institute is not to be a think tank. We're not looking at writing white papers and having lots of uh, panel discussions that don't go anywhere. We're actually looking to see how we can make a difference on issues. How do we be a do tank? How do we take action ourselves instead of recommending action that somebody else ought to do? Uh, so that's the ethos that we've built for the McCain Institute, and we are delighted to be partnering today with Prime Policy and with the National Association of Counties to focus on an issue of critical importance, critical humanitarian importance, both in the United States and around the world, and that is the issue of human trafficking. Uh, there is no one that I have ever met, no one I believe any of you could ever find or meet, who believes that human trafficking is a good thing. It is a reprehensible abuse of humanity, whether for sex trafficking or for forced labor. And yet it happens. It happens a lot. It happens in our country. It happens in our cities, in our counties, in our states, and it happens internationally. And so with that, we decided as a McCain Institute, this would be one of the prime areas we wanted to focus on in the humanitarian area. How can we make sure that we mobilize the right understanding, the right resources, the right actions to stop this? Because no one wants to see it happen, and yet it continues. And so that's been the area that we've tackled there. And what we found as we got into this is, first off, there's terrible data about human trafficking. We don't have good numbers. And secondly, there's very little awareness that it is happening in our own communities. That's one of the reasons why it persists is because people believe it's somewhere else. It's not right here. And so with that, we embarked on a lot of public awareness raising, including a conversation series such as we have today. And we've also embarked on a lot of community level work. And that's why the National Association of Counties is such an ideal partner for us today, because what we have to do has to happen at a local level. We need to build local awareness. We need to work with local officials. We need to work with local law enforcement, with local uh, social services workers. And we need from there to be able to start making a difference in communities. If we do that successfully, then we have a basis for building up and making state level policy and national level policy and even internationally. So that's what we've been trying to do as an institute. We've been at this for about five years. We are delighted with what we've seen with the increase in public awareness. We've had some great success stories that we have, have been fortunate to be a part of. It's a growing community of people dedicated to fighting this. And I think we can say that despite the persistence of the problem, we, we are optimistic now that we are really mobilizing a lot of support to actually attack it in a serious way. So that's why we're here today, and we're delighted that you've dedicated some time out of your day to join us. Again, let me thank Prime Policy and Charlie Black, one of our Human Trafficking Advisory Council board members. And I'd like now to introduce the Executive Director of the National Association of Counties, Matt Chase, who will take the program from here. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank the Ambassador for participating and sponsoring this with McCain Institute and Prime Policy. In addition to Charlie Black, Black, his wife Judy also has been instrumental in all of this. So it is truly a partnership of the two spouses, and so we want to want to thank them. For the National Association of Counties, we recently opened this new facility in partnership with the National League of Cities. This was our vision to bring leaders from across the country together to talk about really serious issues. Many of you are probably wondering why do the nation's counties care about this topic? We actually did a survey of our sheriffs a couple years ago. This rose to the top of our agenda, including one of our county supervisors who is now retired, but Supervisor Don Kanabi from Los Angeles County continuously brought it up. The counties across the country, we have our sheriffs that are law enforcement. They also maintain our jails. We also employ the judges, the prosecutors, the public defenders, but also social service, human services across this country. And it kept coming up that our individuals that were coming through the foster care system or group homes were often later on in life being trafficked, including for sex trafficking. And so it really has been a big issue. What we are trying to do with our county leaders, including push up to the state and federal level, is to really remind folks that these are victims, they're not criminals. 
And for years and years and years, these folks were being arrested, put into jail, and essentially criminalized and taught to be criminals. And instead, especially the underage folks, they are victims. They are being forced into this behavior, whether it's on the labor side or the sex side, what have you. And as we really started to look at this, we discovered it was a problem everywhere, from Tyson's Corner, Virginia, to Houston, to Los Angeles, to our rural communities in North Dakota with the oil and gas fields. It was literally everywhere, and it's very sophisticated. We had an event at the National Press Club where we actually brought in one of our county employees from Los Angeles who could only go by her first name. She can never use her last name. She was trafficked since she was 13 years old till 18 years old. She accounted for how she went to 38 states, including the Hay Adams Hotel across the street from the White House during an uh, event. And that she probably sat next to you on an airplane and you had no idea that she was, looked like just an average 17 year old. But in fact, she had a gentleman on the plane who was watching her at every moment and really could not do anything about it. So these are really serious issues and the more you get into it, the more disturbing it is. And so we're really pleased as the National Association of Counties to partner with the McCain Institute, to partner with Prime Policy and with Charlie's leadership and to have a really distinguished panel today. So what we'll do is we'll bring out Senator Amy Klobuchar who represents the state of Minnesota. We're pleased that the Senator was a former county attorney, which is in Minnesota is the prosecuting attorney as well as the civil attorney for the county. She's shown exceptional leadership as she's ascended to the U.S. Senate. We are gonna be joined by Commissioner Jim McDonough from Ramsey County, Minnesota who has some interesting personal perspectives on all this, as well as he's chair of NACO's Large Urban County Caucus, those counties 500,000 population and above. Then we're joined by Commissioner Melissa McKinley from Palm Beach County, Florida. She may want to talk to you about the security cost of the Southern White House and what Palm Beach County is occurring, but today we've asked her to limit her conversation to human trafficking. And then we also will be joined by Congresswoman Ann Wagner, the U.S. Representative from the 2nd District of Missouri, which is, oh, she is here. Welcome. <laughs> and then our moderator that will lead the discussion, I was joking with her, when you read her bio, it makes you feel really inferior. She, has a Rhodes, she was a Rhodes Scholar and a Truman Scholar, and I told her, no wonder I didn't get one. She took them all. But the reality is uh, Martina Vanderberg is the founder and president of the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center. They provide pro bono services around this topic. They have over 3,000 pro bono attorneys nationwide that handle human trafficking matters. She's got an exceptional uh, bio here with dealing with the International Bar Association, the American Bar Association around this topic. So Martina, please take it away and thank you again. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see such an enormous crowd here to discuss the issue of human trafficking. And we are joined by a truly remarkable panel of real experts who are working both at the local level and at the federal level to combat human trafficking. So without further ado, I want to move straight to our panel because I know all of you are extremely interested in, in what they have to say and all that they've been doing locally. So I'm going to start with Congresswoman Ann Wagner. Could you talk to us a little bit about the work that you've been doing to combat human trafficking? I, I, will. I appreciate Thank you. Um, having the opportunity. Is this turned on? It is. Can you hear me? OK, great. Um, uh, to to uh, uh, go first, and, and, I, and Senator, I thank you for your courtesy in, in that no regard, problem. too. We are voting in the House, and we are voting a big, long swath, and I am on roller skates, and you're going to have to duck out and head back. But I so wanted to get over and, um, and see all of you and, um, and congratulate you for the work that you're doing. You are the front lines. I, I, I will say this. County officials are, uh, you're the ground game, and we can't deliver justice without, um, without all of you. Um, are, there, are there anybody here from Missouri? I wasn't sure. Oh, all right. Where are you from? Warren County. Warren County. That's wonderful. I've got a little house off Highway 47. Oh, you're my sister? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my Oh, you're my sister. Oh, okay. No. No, my assessor. I have a lot of assessors these days. Is it not working? Yeah, that, that one's good. Is, is uh, Oh, okay. okay. All right. Great, great, great. Uh, I want to, first of all, say that one of the first moves that I made in Congress was to introduce something called the SAVE Act. 
Uh, this is a bill that that uh, uh, criminally or uh, that criminalizes anyone who's knowingly advertising uh, commercial sex acts uh, with uh, sex trafficking victims. And I always put a strong emphasis on the word victims. Now, this I will tell you what this is. Um, uh, a bill that at the time was uh, was not popular. It, it represents a big hit to uh, uh, to those that, that traffic to their bottom line. I just want to give you uh, some some understanding of what that means. In 2015 alone, uh, Backpage.com and its holding company made. Are you ready for this? 153.8 million dollars in net revenue. $153.8 million. Um, now, SAVE Act has become law, uh, but many courts continue to sadly protect online advertisers. Um, I am thus introducing a, a new piece of, of legislation. I, I think we finally settled on a name. It's not for sure yet, but uh, no immunity for online sex trafficker, or traffickers act. So, And this bill would actually amend Section 230, of the Communications Decency Act. Um, yes, at last, and we're going after the holy grail, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, and mainly it will clarify what websites can be held um, uh, accountable for hosting sex trafficking ads. Uh, the bill ensures that Section 230 does not trump state sex trafficking laws. Each state has a responsibility to protect victims within its borders, and the federal government and the courts must get out of the way and let state prosecutors do their jobs. The courts have come back to us and said we need clarity on, on, on 230. Um, they don't believe that it applies to state law. They believe that it's fuzzy when it comes to federal laws, and there are no civil penalties that come with it. So we are going to go in and um, in a very, uh, a very specific and uh, surgical manner to um, – uh, to do this, it was you know 230 was never as as we all know intended to be uh, to create a lawless internet uh, at all. There where people could commit, as I say, crimes online that they couldn't commit offline. Uh, and websites participating in human trafficking, uh, frankly, just no longer can be tolerated and should no longer be able to hide um, behind this. Uh, as you know, enough children have been sold under uh, the eyes of our judicial system, and I am going to need all of your help and effort. Uh, we have tremendous support, but we know that the um, Internet companies will fight me as they did tooth and nail uh, uh, before. So several other initiatives we have going on, the Trafficking Survivors Relief Act. Don't forget this. This is one that's going to expunge their federal criminal uh, records for offenses committed uh, directly as, as a result of being trafficked. Very important. loans, housing, all of those kinds of things. Uh, what else have we got on tap here? Um, well, I, the Relief Act, I'd have to say, was something that, ca that came, frankly, out of my being at one of the safe houses and a teenager telling me how uh, the justice system doesn't always necessarily see them um, uh, uh, the way that, and a judge had asked her, this young woman, a child, you know, why was she had chosen to become a, a prostitute? Um, and words can't express the level of heartbreak, I will tell you, that, and sorrow in her, in her brave eyes. So the, the, the Trafficking Survivors uh, Relief Act actually kind of captures the spirit of, of that. So I'm also working, you should know, on a great piece of legislation that would name and shame sex buyers. I am finished with this. And uh, there are some, some counties and some jurisdictions and some states that are doing a fantastic job in this uh, in this space, and we're going to we're going to do that along with legislation that would help healthcare providers receive training uh, to identify um, trafficking victims. Um, mainly, though, I want to say this: legislate. You can't legislate your way out of all of our uh, our countries, our worlds, our municipalities, our local areas, all of our communities' ills. Uh, it takes education and awareness, and there are many on this panel that do so much um, uh, in that in that space, in that arena, arena. And I work with airlines and hotels and travel and convention bureaus and school districts and law enforcement and hospitals, and I go on and prosecutors and on and on and on in, in this area. And um, 
and that is very, very important. We're taking our federal legislation, we're bringing it to the state level, we're hoping you'll pick it up at the local level, and, um, and we're continuing our efforts in terms of education and, um, and, uh, and awareness, which is absolutely key key here. You won't know how this is affecting our neighborhoods and that it is plain, hiding in plain sight. So very, very important. Um, I'm grateful for all that you're doing. Thank you for the uh, for the time today. I'm sorry if I'm going to have to scoot in a, in a minute or two, but uh, uh, you're the front lines and, um, and I just thank you for the time and the opportunity. Thank you, Congresswoman. I think this is a perfect example, though, of how bipartisan this issue is, that Absolutely this is, a, is an issue in this divided city at this moment that is universally universally understood as a human rights violation. So I want to move directly to Senator Klobuchar, who has been such a leader in this area as well. Many of you may have seen Senator Klobuchar introduce a human trafficking survivor, a survivor of forced labor at the Democratic National Convention. So Senator Klobuchar, if you could talk if to us a bit. It, yeah. <laughs> Please. Um, I think is this working? I think it's working, yes. OK. All right. Um, no, no, it's you're going to need a handheld. I don't think it's yeah. down. Yeah. Okay. Good. okay, so yes, that was uh, amazing because it was a lot of people saw that and I think part of this crime is trying to get the word out that it is a crime, uh, but it's not a crime of the victim. And we've uh, really worked on a bipartisan basis to change uh, the whole way people think of this. Uh, I was a county attorney, I say that with pride, uh, as noted for eight years, and um, we just did felonies and then juvenile cases. We did all juvenile cases, so we had about 5,000 a year. And when I started getting involved in this, the internet was new, actually. Um, and we were starting to pick up child porn cases over the internet, and we'd start tracing them back and finding these young uh, girls and sometimes boys uh, who were the actual ones in the photos, because at first it was just a bunch of photos on someone's computer. Um, and then, uh, but still at the time, uh, these young victims were at times referred to as prostitutes, and that was seen as a crime itself. Um, so by the time I got to the Senate and started working on this, we really started looking at it in a different way. And that is what the Safe Harbor Bill was about that was included in the bigger bill that Senator Cornyn and I uh, authored in the Senate, uh, along with our House um, cohorts. And the uh, Safe Harbor Bill is based on a model that we've seen successful in a number of states. And my commissioner over here, my neighboring commissioner uh, from the St. Paul area will talk about that. And that is this idea of um, with that we've really developed in Minnesota big time. And that's seeing the victim as a victim. Um, and that there's no such thing as a child prostitute. And out of that, in Minnesota, has come, in his county, some really strong prosecutions from that county attorney as well as county attorneys throughout our state. And our U.S. attorney has personally handled a major case out of Rochester, Minnesota. Um, so what happens, of course, when you treat these children as the victims they are. They tend to then testify more. They're going to turn on the pimps. And it enables you to go after uh, the big fish, the people that are running these rings. Um, and so what our bill does uh, that passed is create some, some money funds for grants um, throughout the United States. But it also uh, puts incentives in place for this safe harbor law. So what's going on now is the implementation of that. Uh, the former administration put out at the end of the year an uh, implementation plan for best practices. And I think about my time as prosecutor having the domestic violence best practices was always really helpful. And it's the same kind of thing here. So we can see what is going on in these other counties and these other states. And as we know, um, uh, in my former life as a county official, uh, that while the, f the feds handle some cases, almost all of them are handled at the local level. And that's going to continue except for these major rings. And we want to give people the tools that they need. Uh, other things that are going on right now is a continued effort with the private sector, uh, hotels, have done incredible work where uh, there are standards developed and people sign agreements and protocols that they're going to train uh, their workers because they're on the front line and see things first. Um, the airline uh, airline attendants, the flight attendants came up with the idea for training because some of the airlines had, and Senator Warner and I took that on, passed it last year uh, with the help of our flight attendants. I, I couldn't quite understand at first. Honestly, we're at a press conference at Reagan Airport, and I, I believe 
relieved that the flight attendant saw this and then I started talking to them in the back well I don't get it like so you guys just notice someone on a plane and they explained to me how the suspicious behavior and how, how they led and then some of them said a lot of them proposition us so we figure it out when they're with a kid okay pretty direct um, and so they are getting trained throughout the United States and the trucking industry is now getting involved so I'm working uh, they have a group called truckers against trafficking nice alliteration with them. It yeah, it's very good uh, but I think in addition to making this much more mainstream and how we take on this crime um, and see it as a bad thing having guys that are truckers say it's a bad thing is really helpful so it's not just women thanks buddy um, <laughs> up on up on the panel so I, uh, I I think that this is a big part of this as we go forward and then uh, the final thing will just be to keep getting funding for shelters and other things to help uh, these victims uh, turn their lives around and oh one more last thing uh, Bob Corker and I did a, a McCain Institute panel uh, together and uh, talked about the reauthorization um, of the of the uh, foreign relations bill which is really important to this as well uh, which is to um, make this a priority internationally and as you know we have that sex trafficking report and all the countries are always worried about how they do on it which I think is a good one so that's the Trafficking Victims Protection Act uh, I just want to say one shout out to Cindy McCain who I know is in here uh, she has been wonderful to work with uh, we do have done things um, uh, together on this uh, we went to Mexico together uh, and met with all the federal authorities on what's happening down there um, and uh, she has really been the driving force behind this and a lot of the work that goes on in the Senate it's kind of hard to mess with Cindy McCain and uh, <laughs> it's really helped us get a lot of things done so thank you very much thank you Senator Klobuchar and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna scoot right now I'm so sorry to make sure that I won't miss uh, what you have to say there yeah. we're, we're calling votes again I have to, to dash I will be in Pacific, Missouri at a truck stop during the big uh, Truckers Against oh, Trafficking okay. event um, in, in, in March. I want to say thank you to Senator Klobuchar. Oh, she is, you, uh, yeah. The work we do is, um, is one that does bring this town and this nation together. It is bipartisan. Mm -hmm. It is on behalf of, um, uh, of, of women and, uh, and men and boys and children, and I am just so grateful to her continued uh, leadership in the Senate. And I look forward to, to partnering on more things. Yeah. Go get them at the local level. It's up to you. Um, you're the ground force, so I thank you, um, and I'm going to dash and do my other job. So thank you. Thank you. So I want to I, I want to move on to Commissioner McDonough. So we'll stay in the same state. But I want to move on to uh, Commissioner McDonough. Senator Klobuchar mentioned some of the work that you're doing with Safe Harbor. Can you explain what the Safe Harbor work is and how you've come to be involved in human trafficking? Sure, Th and thank you. A big issue for a short amount of time here with four people that really are immersed in it locally or nationally. Safe Harbor. Um, actually, I got involved, uh, real briefly, I got involved at a, at a conference, a NACL conference out here in 2007, 7.30 a.m., large Urban County Caucus Breakfast, and the presenter talked about sexual violence and harm in our communities. Cordelia Anderson um, connected with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Fortunately, she was based in Minnesota when I got back. I just couldn't get that out of my mind from that, that presentation I was able to, and I, that's how I got, got in, into this. And um, But the Safe Harbor piece in Minnesota, um, we're fortunate we have a Safe Harbor law. We've had a lot of champions. But I'll tell you, it seems that it seems a no sometimes boys, as uh, victims slash survivors rather than delinquents and criminals, we could only get them to approve up to age 16. We had to go back to get them to approve to 18. And then we went back where we could actually divert um, young women, young men up to the age of 24. But it's a continued evolution and building on it. One of the things I'm really proud of in Minnesota is our safe harbor, we got um, implemented and put in our public health department. We take a public health approach to this. It's about prevention. It's about trauma-informed. Um, it's about result, tr building resiliency when you have the opportunity to work with these young girls and, as I said, sometimes boys. 
One of the biggest things we've learned since uh, 2016 when we opened up our first beds and Senator Klobuchar and Cindy McCain were there when we opened up our first beds to celebrate with us. You, you think almost that, you know, these young girls are going to think, you know, we're here to save you, we're here to help you. That's so much not the response. The grooming that goes in and the trauma that usually has occurred in their lives before even contacting a sex trafficker. And then that grooming and that dependency, whether it's through drug abuse and, and supplying drugs or this total dependency on one or two individuals, I mean, it's, that bond is so strong. And, and because we're now out of the correction system, public health, human service beds, we do not lock our facilities for these girls. We have panic delays that notify staff if they're going to run. Um, and we felt how it was really important to keep these girls in the community, try to connect them back to families if those families were supportive and functional. A lot of times the trauma starts in the families that these girls are coming from. But one of the strategies we had to address right away because this, I mean, they would just, the traffickers would pull up in the parking lot and these girls would run and away they go. As we actually try, you know, in the East Metro, we'll put these girls in the West Metro beds and we'll move the girls from the West to put some distance between them and the traffickers. Um, so much to talk about here. You know, one of the things that we've seen in Minnesota, I know we're seeing across the country, trafficking is so lucrative. We see gan gangs actually moving to or enhancing their drug businesses with trafficking, right? The because, opioid, yep, opioid. you can keep reusing, reusing, reselling. And so it is just, it's so expansive in our community. And we really, the more I learned about this, the, the more I just understand how expansive. And, you know, Clever Shirt talked about me as a man. And one of the issues that I really talk about a lot is when I first started getting involved, all the advocates, all the leadership was coming from women, everywhere you looked. And really the demand, the men are the, the, the demand, right? They are the ones that are driving the supply. And we need men to step up, and we need truckers to step up, we need county commissioners to step up, we not, need doctors. The, the Johns, or I call perpetrators, are not just men on the uh, you know, edges of our society. They are mainstream in our society. And to give you the example how mainstream when I went back and I wanted to start really getting involved in helping under myself understand, but then really trying to move forward, I met with our public health director because in Ramsey County we had sexual our sexual assault services were in public health. You know, he really pushed me to make sure as a commissioner elected this was something that I was coming from here and here, right, and that I was going to stick with this. And, you know, we worked together um, for three or four years. He retired. Within six months of retiring, his picture was in our paper. He was picked up on a sting with a 14-year-old girl, my public health director. And I bring that up because that's how prevalent this is in society. And that's why men, and I'm speaking to every one of you in this room, we need to find, have conversations, how we raise our boys and how we challenge our friends, our peers, are the folks that we interact with every day about attitudes towards sexual violence and harm because it fuels the sex trafficking side of this. That's at this far end of the continuum. And the damage uh, that occurs in that and the uh, responses that we have to have within our communities. And so public health with a prevention model, trauma-informed, building in resiliency is all the areas that we've been working in Minnesota when we come in contact with these girls, but starting with runaways. I mean, that's some of the areas where we know the girls, even truancy, we're, we're building into our truancy programs, trying to even get to these young ladies before they get picked up or have a contact with a trafficker. So we need to... That's coming from me, but I'm going to shut this off. <laughs> there we go. So I want to... Sorry, folks. It's just a sign of how horrible human trafficking is. Even, yeah. even the sound system has protested. Yeah. So I want to move to uh, Commissioner McKinley. M Commissioner McKinley, you've, you've, you've really taken a leadership role in Florida uh, to fight human trafficking and, and also to um, 
look at this with a, a new approach. Can you talk about the new approach that you've taken on board in, in Florida in terms of changing people's thinking about, about human trafficking? Sure. First, let me start off by first we gave you hanging chads, and now we're giving you broken microphones. <laughs> so no wonder I'm down here on this end by myself. Um, you know, the, the conversation on human trafficking in Florida actually didn't start until about 2004. So it's a, a fairly new topic for us. I, I started in working on this issue as a volunteer uh, with a great organization, the Junior Leagues of Florida. So it was a statewide advocacy group. And we partnered with the National Council of Jewish Women and started to work on uh, passing legislation at the state level because we were starting to see the problem. We had been introduced to the issue by watching a, a six-minute documentary about a young girl who was a victim. She was six years old, and it was called Fields of Modan. And uh, you know, we just started working on the issue from that point. So 2004, prior to that, there was no definition of human trafficking in Florida statute. So we had to start there first. And uh, for the first few years, it was so focused on the trafficker. And no legislation was really focused on the victim. Uh, so we had to get the definition in statute first. Then we had to find uh, ways to prosecute the traffickers, so we were able to do it as a precursor to racketeering and able to you know, prosecute the uh, offenders under RICO acts. And we moved from there to um, eventually a few, few, few years later, expanded it to not only sex trafficking, but also labor trafficking. Uh, that hadn't really been a conversation at that point, which particularly for Florida, where you've got a high tourism industry and you've got a high agricultural industry, making sure you had all the types of trafficking covered was important. Um, then we went on to uh, be able to provide services to survivors of trafficking uh, when they had the, the guts to come forward on it. And so we were focused on the immigrant population of women mostly that were being trafficked in the state of Florida and being able to provide services to them much like we would provide services to refugees. We realized after a while that a lot of the victims that were coming forward were not just immigrants. They were children in our own child welfare system. And so uh, I think it was about 2012, we added domestic sexual trafficking to our statutes in Florida. And from there, it just snowballed into the pieces of legislation that were very victim-centered, um, being able to uh, help a, a victim um, expunge their records. And so we actually, the state will provide free expungement and so, and then uh, public record exemptions. So any record that they did have, you know, the media couldn't access that. Uh, being classifying a victim, especially a juvenile victim, as a dependent rather than a delinquent, which enabled them to get services under our child welf welfare system. And in Florida, that's the Department of uh, Children and Families. And so we saw the conversation shift. And uh, so I, I, when I was elected, and I've only been elected since 2014, and so my, my record is not as long as the, you know, my previous two speakers, um, but we started, I started to recognize that this was really a conversation that we needed to have at the local level. And we had, um, we had sponsors for legislation that dealt with the posting of the trafficking awareness hotline, the national hotline. And they were, the, the legislation was focused on putting the hotline signs in our major traffic hubs, transportation hubs. There was no local component to that. And I had a little pushback from uh, our very business-friendly legislature that they did not want to impose any restrictions or additional requirements on small business owners. And so I went to them and I don't know if my legislative team is here, but Rebecca De La Rosa and Todd Von Laren, who I get to work with, uh, we went to our folks in the legislature and we said, then let local government do it. Put the onus on us to regulate these businesses in our community. It was imperative to me that if we were really going to help the victims, we needed to go to the establishments where many of these victims were employed or uh, being trafficked. And for me, that was in our strip clubs in our other adult entertainment establishments, your massage parlors, your movie theaters, your bookstores that are adult entertainment uh, related. And so we passed that. 
in the legislature. And then I think we've got out of 67 counties in Florida, we may be up almost to two dozen counties that have passed the local implementing language that requires the posting of those signs. But what's so important about being able to post those signs, law enforcement said we need a tool we need a tool to be able to go into these establishments when we don't have probable cause, and we don't have a search warrant. So the way that we connected law enforcement with local government to be able to go into those establishments was through our code enforcement officers. And so law enforcement can partner with code enforcement and they can go into these establishments and they can search, they can keep their eyes open for something that looks suspicious while code enforcement is looking to make sure these signs are posted correctly. And uh, we just did um, our first uh, training, or actually our first, I don't know, an operation, uh, operation strip club, where we had our uh, code enforcement officers go out and uh, go to all the clubs to make sure the signs were posted. And we were able to find a, pretty un a, a few unscrupulous operators and so hopefully we'll see some prosecution charges from that. But I will say we partnered, you partnered with the truckers. Uh, we just partnered with weekend before Super Bowl with the club owners against sex trafficking. And I am probably one of the first elected officials to thank in a tweet uh, and tag all of the strip clubs in Palm Beach County thanking them. Uh, because they don't want this in most of them, the good operators, and you're always going to have these types of establishments. We can't <laughs> legislate morality. And uh, they have been very good partners with us in trying to work to identify trafficking victims. So we tried to bring it back local. That's really interesting. So I want to pick up on a thread of something that you mentioned. You mentioned the need to expand the local law to include labor trafficking. And one of the things that we see at the federal level is, is actually, sadly, a, a, a very small number of labor trafficking cases. The, the number of prosecutions at the federal level across the board in 2014 was 257 in the entire United States, every US attorney's office. And of the 257, only nine were for forced labor. Wow. So I'm wondering, at the local level, what, what are you each doing at the local level to make sure that forced labor cases are also prosecuted by, by local prosecutors, as well as the very important sex trafficking cases. Uh, Commissioner McDonough, do you want to start? And then we'll go to Commissioner McKinley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I mentioned earlier that our statewide task force is actually called Human Trafficking Task Force to include sex trafficking and forced labor trafficking. It started from uh, efforts to really address sex trafficking, but the issue of, of forced labor I think is even farther underground than sex trafficking. There's yeah. been wind in the sails, right? You've got leaders nationally at the local level, at the state level, over the last 10 to 12, 15 years to really start daylighting the issues around sex trafficking. But forced labor trafficking is where we were at with sex trafficking 20 years ago. So far underground and so far off the ra radar that, I mean, you see, that's why you see it that way. And we were very intentional in Minnesota to make sure it was a human trafficking task force. And there's a whole component in there that addresses the forced labor piece of that and takes that down into the local level. Great, thank you. Um, Commissioner McDonough, um, do you want to hand the mic, please, to Commissioner McKinley? Do you want, can you answer the same question about, about forced labor? Uh, we haven't. And that's an area that we need to work on. Um, it's it's difficult to uh, to to get those types of regulations on the books in Florida right now. Um, it's in terms of requiring these these private owned companies to to do to do something. But what we are trying to do is, and it's new, and it should be coming back to our commission soon, is developing a training program that we can work with our chambers and our business development boards and our tourism development councils to go out and train their own employees on recognizing the signs and symptoms. But in terms of what I'm able to do, um, I, I'm a county commissioner, mm -hmm. you know, and our prosecution side is handled at the state level. And so we can educate, mm -hmm. but we can't force anybody to prosecute. Right. So we're just working on trying to develop an educational component, right. uh, especially right. in our agricultural community in Western Palm Beach County. So that's that's interesting. I think there's a rising level of understanding about this. The McCain Institute, for example, has just started a forced labor program as well. So, Mr. Klobuchar, I want to I want to work uh, to speak with you for a moment about the 
about the amazing work that you've been doing on Safe Harbor, both at the federal and at the at the state level, and also on, on vacature, which is one of the sort of really cutting edge issues in terms of vacating convictions for trafficking survivors. So are there things that you're working on now in the Senate that would sort of move the ball along to try and create safe harbor laws or vacate your laws across the country? Well, a few things. First, I just want to, I was thinking that human trafficking issue and how I want to get those stats from you because oh, I'm, I'm <laughs> no, I'm meeting with the nominees for deputy attorney general on Monday in my Excellent. office. So I thought this is so <laughs> perfect um, uh, because I think that uh, Senator Sessions, now Attorney General Sessions, had worked on these issues with me on the Judiciary Committee. Um, and of course, Loretta Lynch actually made this a big priority because she um, had been a former U.S. attorney, as had her deputy. And um, this incoming deputy, who's supposed to be good, is um, also, I'm sure, has done these cases out of Maryland. So I think we could really try to rev this up at the same time um, to try to shift some focus uh, to human trafficking. And I know that the president did a meeting um, just last week um, uh, with um, Ashton Kutcher's group um, that has done some technology changes. So I, I just got a bunch of ideas in my head as I was sitting here thinking, uh, listening to my colleagues of some things that we can do. Um, as for the safe harbor laws, I think that should be another topic that I address with them on Monday and with Senator Session. Remember, the bill is um, all pegged to the COPS funding, our bill to create incentives. And there's some movement of the COPS groups, um, including the Fraternal Order of Police that um, supported uh, the president, are very much behind Senator Mikowski's and my bill to actually expand uh, COPS funding. But there's a lot of rumors it could be cut. And that would obviously help hurt us with our sex trafficking incentives if we lost uh, the COPS program. And so I think that. Part of this is going to be uh, making sure we keep those incentives in place so we keep it going, um, trying to get the money out there from the grants. And the fact that the president did a meeting on this, I think we can really push this with the Justice Department um, to make this a big priority. And I know Senator Cornyn's interested in that, too. And with the new administration, other, other than this yeah. one meeting at the White House, with the new administration, do you see any tea leaves that you can read in terms of what their support on trafficking issues will oh, be? I'm really good at predicting that. No, I'm not really. <laughs> I, uh, well, I did predict there'd be a more positive tone in the speech. I was right about you that. Were right. Um, and uh, I just know that uh, Senator Sessions um, has really has made this a priority before I asked about it at his hearing. Um, so, you know, I'm hopeful on that front. They, they're putting in a U.S. attorney as deputy. Um, and I just think that, you know, we, you always find partners where, where you can. Um, supposedly Ivanka Trump has wanted to make this a priority. So, you know, all of these things could lead to um, this issue. So I'm getting a little more attention. But I do think that the last administration did a lot, especially with the State Department. So we always have to keep that going as well. As you probably know, 80, eight, over 80% 80 of the victims in the U.S. are from the U.S. A lot of times people imagine this as something from far away. Um, and I was thinking of some of my rural commissioners out there. Um, there have been huge issues. They did some stings in rural Minnesota. It was unbelievable around New Ulm and Mankato, where you're from, the Blue Earth County area, um, and had dozens and dozens of arrests just from placing one ad with underage, the advertising underage. Um, and I was just down there in New Ulm, Minnesota, and did an event, and the police were just shocked by what they'd seen. So it's kind of scary to think when you have less resources, you're in a rural area, that this is going on. And that's why I get back to when you look at the new administration coming in, trying to get a cultural change on how we talk about this issue, at the same time we up the prosecutions on the federal level. Right. Um, I think you have to have both things going on at the local and then all the way up to, to the White House. So I know that because we've had such strong bipartisan support, I'm not as concerned as something completely go ter being turned off uh, with the new administration coming in. Let's hope you're reading this one right. Okay, you well, know, I do. When a meeting happens in the first month, that's a good <laughs> sign. So I want to pull, uh, pull out uh, something else that you mentioned, Commissioner McKinley. You mentioned this link with the opioid epidemic. So can you can you address, and I'd like actually all of you to, to answer this question because I think it's an important question to address, but can you can you talk about this intersection between opioid epidemic, epidemic and, and human trafficking? Well, we have, um, we have a task force in Palm Beach County that's looking at this issue. 
and uh, through some of the, they convened a grand jury and the grand jury came down with a bunch of recommendations and gave uh, our state attorney the uh, ability to go in and do a couple of crackdowns on some uh, sober home operators and for those of you that aren't familiar with sober homes these are where place these are places where people coming out of residential re drug rehab uh, they go and they live while they get their outpatient treatment. And we found in that cycle, uh, some of the sober homes that have been busted actually had a trafficking component into it, or in it. And um, Kenny Chapman is a case in Palm Beach County that comes to mind. But I mean, here you're dealing with a vulnerable population, and we talked about the involvement of the child welfare system. Uh, there was a documentary that was done called Foster Shock, and there is a young girl who talks about not being able to get the the monies that she needs in terms of a stipend to be able to buy the things that she needs and she's vulnerable and people pick up bad people pick up on that vulnerability and take advantage of them and they're sucked into this world of drugs and and trafficking and uh, you know if they're able to get out of it or maybe get into a, a drug rehab program and then they come out and they're put right back into these vulnerable situations and they're preyed upon mm -hmm. and so there is definitely a link um, you know they're 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 coerced, they're forced, their identities are stolen, and they're in these homes and they're making money for these people that are also getting money from the insurance companies for, for su supposed substance abuse treatment. Um, they're drugged and, uh, you know, they're, they're forced against their will to behave in a way that they normally would never behave in. And so there's definitely a link. Mm -hmm. And until we crack down on all the factors that make these folks or these young women and these young men vulnerable, um, we're going to continue to see this situation. Commissioner McDonough, have you have you seen this in Minnesota as well? So there's so there's so many different paths for these um, traffickers to really intersect with a young woman. Uh, the the opioid piece is is really kind of ex expanding and driving on one of those paths. One of those paths is being addicted dr to drugs before you're trafficked. And you get to the point where that ad addiction just drives you so strongly that you begin to trade sex for drugs and pretty soon that person's trafficking you out there to anybody and it's, it was your original drug addish, ad addiction that made you vulnerable and attracted you as a prey to these um, traffickers. And this opioid addiction that is so strong, right? It is so strong that it has taken so many in our community from places they never thought they would be to the point where they, you know, they're all willingly putting themselves in a position to be trafficked for that drug. That's how strong that is. And so, it, you know, the, there's so many ways to come into it, but that's an uh, area that we're seeing expanded. And then trying to break that cycle even gets harder. I talked about, you know, the trying to break that cycle when you have that dependency on drugs and that was what's driving you in the beginning to really get into or get connected to that trafficker. So Senator Klobuchar, do you want to comment on that issue? No, I think well? they, they answered yeah. it well. Just that I think we, um, Senator Portman, um, who also does a lot of work with sex trafficking, and Senator Ayotte and Senator Whitehouse and I passed that CARA bill uh, this last year on the um, opioid epidemic, which really set a blueprint uh, going forward for treatment and other things. And um, now we got funding at the end of the year for that, which was, I think, a um, billion dollars, pretty good. Um, and we are um, uh, pretty excited about the work that, that we're going to start doing on the federal level on that. And we're also pushing the prescription drug monitoring and a bunch of things that are seem unrelated to sex trafficking and human trafficking, but really aren't, because I think the commissioner has explained it well, how simple it is to see if you get someone addicted, you're a pimp, you just get them addicted, and it's so easy to get addicted on opiates. People do it to go into the emergency room and get 10 pills and bring it home, and they're addicted. Well, imagine what a pimp could do. So they get them addicted, and then they just get them on the, in the sex trade or even human trafficking trade. So that's what's been going on, and so our job is not only to go after the human trafficking, trafficking, but then also to go after addiction, because if you can get some of these pills off the market and uh, do something about that, you're going to have less addicts. But I, I don't think it's a surprise at all with the rise of the internet, which I don't mean that as a bad way as a whole, but uh, the way people are, can find victims more easily, people who maybe would have had trouble going to uh, buy sex somewhere now can just simply do it by going on a website. That's made it easier. 
opioid abuse spreading all over the rural areas. That's made it easier. Um, and then you just have the, the cultural change in how women have been treated, and uh, that's also made it easier. So it's, it's a really bad threesome of factors that have conspired here. There's also a fourth factor which is troubling, which is we're seeing an increase. We have a, a data set. Yeah. I'm fine. We're seeing an increase in the trafficking of people uh, with disabilities. And in some cases, people with disabilities are trafficked and then forcibly injured in order to obtain opioids from emergency rooms. So there's a case that was prosecuted by federal prosecutors in Ohio, US, US versus Callahan, prosecuted by a wonderful federal prosecutor, Chelsea Rice, where the victim was literally purposefully injured time and time again so that they could get pills for their for their own and use. They believed it more because they were people, someone with disabilities, that they were getting these repeated injuries. Yeah. So it was. It's a. It's a really problematic area. So I just want to ask one last question, and then I'm going to turn to the audience. So if you have burning questions, you should start thinking about and getting ready to ask them. But I just want to turn back for a moment um, to Florida because Florida actually is a real model on the vacating of convictions. And you know, New York was first, but then Florida came in with a law that is credited by Kate Mogulescu, who's really the leading expert in the United States on vacature. Florida is credited with having really the best law. So I, I wonder if you can explain, since, since really we're, we're looking here at best practices, what, what, would, what makes the Florida vacature law so, so good, in your view? Is it the breadth? Is it? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's because, you know, you're, and, and the senator said it perfectly, there's no such thing as a child prostitute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Supervisor Don Canabi from L.A. County is, is really the one that's got that stuck in my head, and I'll never forget it. And uh, people who are trafficked, who are charged with prostitution, mm -hmm. um, sh they're victims. And so I think Florida being a leader in the country and recognizing that they're not prostitutes, they're victims, um, mm -hmm. is really what makes this law work. But adding into that, like I mentioned earlier, the records expungement mm -hmm. and the ability to help those victims have that expungement process paid for, the ability for those victims to not have their criminal record remain a part of public record, you know, it, it's a it's a whole package mm -hmm. to be able to provide relocation assistance to victims so they can get away from their traffickers and provide them those protections so that we can actually get them, you know, the traffickers prosecuted. Um, it, it, it's not just one thing that makes it good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's the whole package. And I have to say in Florida, you know, we've had three governors in, since we passed our first law in 2004. We've had Jeb Bush, we've had Charlie Crist, and now we have Rick Scott. And a lot of the organizations uh, that have worked on these bills, the, the state representatives, the state senators, they're coming from both sides of the aisle. You know, we have very conservative governors in, in, in the governor's office, and every one of them has made this a priority. And I think so that atmosphere, that environment in Tallahassee, and in local governments be able to make these happen every year is what's made our model successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I want to turn this to the audience. And are there questions that folks have top of mind? Go ahead, please. Could you please introduce yourself? And then please ask a brief question rather than a statement. Pat Trubley, President of National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Mostly for you, Senator, uh, Congresswoman Wagner said that she's going to introduce an amendment to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. That's the uh, provision that Backpage and others rely upon for their total immunity. That's what the courts have said on this. But of course, it's a misinterpretation of that act set up to protect children. So uh, the concern we have is that when a bill like that is introduced, the tech companies are going to come at you and all the others and say, we're not going to give up our immunity. Uh, you know. Uh, so what is, is Congress going to cave on that or are they going to go with the victims? That's um, my question. Oh, well, I don't, <laughs> first of all, I'd love to uh, do more in this area, uh, but there's two things that we've run against, uh, and I know Senator Feinstein worked really hard and Senator Kirk and other people on this issue. Uh, one is that uh, issue with the lobbying and then there's a few senators and you know how things can get held up um, if one senator does it. Um, but the second is the... Um, 
First Amendment issues. Um, and so I want to look at what she's doing because I would love to do something there. It's just that um, we, you're right, it has been hard, but it's not always just the tech companies. It's also some of the First Amendment arguments uh, that some of the senators really embrace, even though I might not agree with their argument. And it's been rough sledding. What we did do instead, as you know, pretty effectively was the Homeland Security Committee uh, started these investigations into Backpage, and the day before the hearing, uh, they voluntarily took that site down uh, and very grudgingly, and they were not exactly pleasant at the hearing um, and didn't can't, they asserted their rights and didn't answer any questions. But um, and then I've heard since from some of my cops that, in fact, some of the ads are just appearing in other parts of the page. Uh, and uh, But I think the efforts of keep pushing on that, uh, the credit card companies that are processing them uh, to try to get them to stop doing that and then seeing if there's any legislation that we could move on because it has been... I agree, really frustrating when those ads are just sitting there. Um, I just know this from dealing on the state side with it. It's not been easy to pass things in this area, uh, either because of courts or other people saying, well, that's going to cover us too, and so uh, we think it would be a problem. It's been, it just seems crazy to me that you can engage in that kind of criminal activity uh, right there in front. So, so other, other questions? Yes, please. And please uh, announce yourself and ask, and ask a question. Thank you very much. Van Stumberg, Blue Earth County Commissioner, uh, Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, as a former police officer, a former sexual assault investigator, I really appreciate what you're doing here. Uh, my concern is pay. And uh, the small rural communities in the uh, outer areas don't have the type of money to pay their, you know, officers to do this sort of investigation. Uh, you mentioned New Ulm, you mentioned uh, a Senator, and thank you very much. You mentioned Blue Earth County. I always love it when you do that. Even for <laughs> sex trafficking cases. But yeah. <laughs> but, All right, but, but I, I was more positive in my speech yesterday. I understand. Uh, okay. But um, the only reason that we can do this right now is because uh, we were provided a grant to take um, multiple counties across our area to be able to, to do this uh, investigation. We need to get federal money to do this. Now, I, I know that the money not only needs to come for uh, the investigation and law enforcement, also for the, um, the educational portion of this. I've been at this long enough to know that uh, that's very, very important. But uh, um, if we can get something through Congress, something to to make sure that the rural counties across the United States have the type of money to be able to uh, investigate these crimes, it would make a huge difference. Right. Okay. Thank you. And I think part of that is I am concerned about cuts across the board on the domestic side, which could affect uh, some of the work that you're talking about, even that's going on now, much less expanding it. Um, despite my hope that this will be a priority of the new administration, some of the cuts that are being discussed, not specifically to this, but just to all law enforcement, if you look at as part of domestic, could be a real concern. Uh, but I think that trying to uh, fund these things and help on the local level would be great, and that's why this COPS, expanding the COPS program uh, would be helpful, as well as targeted programs with this. I did ask um, Senator Sessions, I have to adjust Attorney General Sessions uh, during the hearing about the um, Office of Domestic Violence, um, and he said he wanted to keep that, domestic violence victims, keep that office strongly in place, which was positive. Um, but we need to do even more, so thank you. Commissioner McDonough, did you want to add something, please? Uh, real bl briefly, one of the things that was incorporated into our statewide safe harbor bill was the ability to increase fines up to, up to $250 more for buyers of sex. And that money is actually put back into the system. I don't recall the percentages, but a percentage of that money goes to helping for pets for the girls. A percentage of it goes to training for law enforcement to help, help identify and work in your community. And a, and a percentage of that actually goes to probably one of those grants you got. But that's ongoing within the state of Minnesota. And that was a key component to our bill was to actually attach a revenue source to help provide local support. The other thing that money does buy is in Minnesota, we have nine regional navigators that help communities rally around 
bringing together their stakeholders on sex trafficking or human trafficking. And that individual navigator has been really important because outstate, this is a really big problem. But as the commissioner identified, the resources are always there, but then there isn't the experience or understanding of the problem sometimes. But it's really the work that we've done through the state association and the counties to elevate that's been important. So the nine regional, that's all paid for, right, under yeah. the state bill. So what we did in Minnesota, as you know, is first we started with some foundation funding, um, which came in part from the Women's Foundation, which was funded in part through Marilyn Carlson Nelson, uh, who is the uh, Radisson Hotels, and um, her family um, owns Radisson Hotels, and she's made this a big priority. So we kind of started that way, and then we got the state bill funded um, for these navigators across the state and some other things. But the one missing piece I think would be great, and you know how we have these Haida districts and things for drug trafficking on the federal level. Uh, you could use that same model uh, with the FBI and federal. And I know talking to some of the officers in rural Minnesota, they've gotten help from U.S. Attorney's Office, FBI, in trying to make that a priority. The Justice Department, which is yet another good question for me to ask the nominee for Deputy Attorney General on Monday. So I think we have time for one very quick last question. I saw your hand first. So please, very quick last question. Hi, well, I'm Nancy Rivard. Um, from airline ambassadors, and oh. we just finished our 52nd uh, tra training at an airport in Houston before the Super Bowl, and we're excited about coming to Minneapolis next year. And, we'll already be out. <laughs> and as one of the primary advocates for human trafficking awareness in the airline industry, um, we helped get some language into the reauthorization bill this year, but more needs to be done. And so, Senator Korbachar, I want to know where the uh, Stop Trafficking on Planes Act is that you helped um, initiate with Senator Warner. Yeah. Does more need to be done on that, or what? What the status? Uh, similar to the terms of the uh, reauthorization. Yeah. I thought it was passed. Yeah. Yeah, it passed as part of the. So, but just, just okay. so just, it passed as part of the FAA reauthorization. But then to right? follow up on that, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act is also up for reauthorization. That is so the is one that, that Senator Corker is heading up out of the Foreign Relations. Is there committee. a time plan? Is there? Um, I can't remember estimate? what he said. I, I mean, he's he was pretty positive. Did you know the time frame on that? I think that they're they're focused on getting enough money through. Right. Uh, okay. All right, but I, I think there's every reason to believe he, he's going to make that a priority. So, so I want to thank this really remarkable panel. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Thank you, commissioners, for all that you have done and for your participation today. I want to thank the McCain Institute and also the National Association of Counties. And I want to put one small plug in for those of you who are looking for data. Uh, the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center has a database of every single criminal indictment in the United States at the federal level since 2009. So if you're interested in doing a docket run on your particular jurisdiction and looking for what kinds of trafficking cases are being prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, that data is, is actually available. So thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you to all of you for, for what you're doing to combat human trafficking. And I think we're a wrap. Thank you. I uh, just want one last word, Charlie Black of the Prime Policy Group. We're honored today to have the chance to co-host with the McCain Institute and, and NACO this terrific event. Um, and let, let, me, let me just uh, parenthetically, because I'm going to close quickly here, say that when Senator Klobuchar talks about working across party lines on a wide range of issues, it's true. I tell you, as a proud Republican, she does, and we, we appreciate the chance to work with her. But thank you, commissioners, also, and, and Martina. This was a great program. It's a very tough issue. And if we had any percentage, small percentage, of elected officials, local, state, and federal, to put the priority on this issue that this gentleman and these ladies do, we'd be much further along. So encourage. Uh, everybody that you know who's an elected official to join with the rest of us to raise awareness and take the tough votes to fight human trafficking. Thank you very much. Thank you.